So I am from UFI, and uh, I'm working, my primary advisor is Marcelo H. Garcia. He's in the civil engineering department. I'm also in the civil engineering department. And I'm co-advised by Paul Fisher, who is in the computer science and the mechanical engineering department. So what I'm going to talk about today is largely simulation of sediment transport at river bifurcations using a highly scalable spectral CFD solver. So for you who are not in the area of river mechanics, there are some things which are uninitiated. So first I will talk about bifurcation. So a bifurcation is when you have a river and it splits into two other river. But in bifurcations, there is a special class which is called the diversions in which the main river continues to flow, but there is a side channel which comes out from the side. So, Today, I will be focusing mainly on the kind of bifurcations which, is, which are di diversions. And then I talked about sediment transport. The way sediment is transported in water is, they are, if they are really fine, they are in suspension in, in the water and move in, in, the, in the higher places in the water column. And if it is of larger size, then they travel as bed load along the bed. So what I'm going to talk, to, the, the phenomena I'm going to discuss today is called Boulier effect. And what Boulier effect means is nonlinear distribution of near bed sediment between lateral and the main channel of stream, uh, a stream and a river. So when I say nonlinear distribution, so if I have, say, a channel which has Q and S, Q is the discharge of water and S is the sediment discharge, and then what continues in the main channel is Q main and S main, and what continues in the side channel is Q side and S side. What you expect is S side by S main is Q side by Q main to the power B. You may expect that B is one. So that means it is a linear distribution according to the water discharge. But experiments have found that this B is not one. It is, so there are, the experiments have found that say for a 30 degree case, a very small amount of water might be going into the side channel, but still a much larger amount of sediment or near bed sediment goes into the side channel. Uh, and it has not just been observed in a 30 degree channel, it has been observed for other angles too, ranging from 30 to 150 degree. And so one of the first experiments which looked at this was in 1926 by Boulier in Germany, and that's why we call this phenomena Boulier effect. After him, there were uh, some works where some experimental work were done by others too, which corroborated his findings. And another interesting work, experimental work, was done by Dancy back in 1946, in which he also found the effect of size of the particle uh, on how much of the how much of the sediment goes into the side channel. So basically, it shows that size of the particle means the bigger particles will be traveling near the bed, and the smaller particles will be traveling up in suspension. So depending on where you are in the water column, more of the sediment will go into the side channel or continues into the main channel. So why do, we, why do I want to study this? My major motivation is to save the deltas all around the world. There are a lot of major deltas all around the world, and a lot of people live on these deltas, and these deltas are at risk because climate change due to subduction of these deltas as well as due to sea level rise, almost half or more than half of these deltas are at high risk. One of the prime examples is the Mississippi River Delta. But what the way to save these deltas has engineers have come up with ways that in which what you can do is you can breach the levees or come up with artificial channels which will take sediment along with water. And so it is very important that we know this physics or mechanism I was talking about, Boulier effect, because it will help to design better systems in th so that we can take in water and efficiently the sediment along with it. So one of these studies which has been uh, already one of the uh, delta rebuilding studies which has already on the drawing board in the United States is rebuilding of the Mississippi River Delta. Studies have shown that if Mississippi River Delta is not rebuilt, it, within the next 50 years, almost 50 to 75% of Mississippi River Delta, that is the state of Louisiana, might be lost. So our US Army Corps of Engineers have been studied of creating these channels or, bif or bifurcations or diversions to take out sediment so that you can rebuild land artificially. 
So basically, the idea for my study is to, to see, to understand the physics or, so that we can build better structure. Also, it will add to the knowledge of uh, better models, to create better models for river bifurcations. So the objectives of this study is the con to conduct uh, high quality larger dissimulations. And when I say high quality, what I mean is we are not going to use any wall models. We are basically will try to resolve uh, everything near the wall because we think, because it's a phenomena which has bed load is involved a lot. So we need to resolve the wall properly. And, and we have also developed a Lagrangian particle model, which will basically will model the sediment. <clears throat> So we will be doing the simulations in, in domains which are very similar to Boulier's experiment and at a scale which is similar to Boulier's experiment, so which makes it, uh, the simulations very computationally intensive. And we will be going through a range of bulk Reynolds number. So at the lower bulk Reynolds number range of 10 to 7,000, the, the resolution of the mesh is good enough to be DNS. So as we go from 7,000 and higher, so say 25,000 or the 20,000 case I'll be talking today, that's the case in which it is more uh, LES rather than a DNS. We will also be studying all different flow splits and also different angles. <clears throat> so um, for that, I'm going to use the open source uh, spectral element uh, code NEC called NEC 5000. And it's a spectral element code which combines the accurate, sorry, oops combines the accuracy of a spectral method with the flexibility of local approaches like the finite element method. NEC uses a higher order Legendre polynomials as basis for function along with gauss lovato Legendre grid. Using the reason to use higher order polynomial eliminates the dispersion, er, dispersion error, which is very important for large scale long term turbulence calculations because we will be running these simulation so that we can reach a step first, a statistically steady state. After that, we will be adding particles. So we need these simulations to run, run really long. So if he has very less dispersion error, then uh, that is very good for our simulation. So in this, uh, <clears throat> in NEC 5000, time stepping is done through Time stepping is done through a third order backward differencing and a combination with an extrapolation method, third order extrapolation for the nonlinear terms. And uh, in case of, so you may ask, what is the LES model we are using? The LES model is nothing but a spectral filter, which is there, and which is a very automatic thing if the resolution of the grid is not high enough to resolve all the turbulence scale, then automatically it takes away energy from the higher wave number. <clears throat> so uh, I will, uh, because it's a, it's a, sim it's a, uh, conference about parallel computing. So I, I should talk about parallel scalability of NEC. So NEC has been known to scale really, really well. And on Mira, it has strongly scaled up to a million uh, per, uh, MPI rank with N by P, N where N is the computer, number of computational points and P is the number of processes going down to all the way up to around 2000. So how does it work on, uh, how did it work for our target problem in Blue Waters? Before that, I will just talk about the configuration and then I will move into the scalability on Blue Waters. So the, as you can see, uh, our configuration is there's an inflow and there will be two outflows. Part of the inflow channel, we are using a recirculatory boundary condition. In, this is done in order to, so that the, the flow which reaches the area of interest, the turbulence is fully formed and the, so, so is the boundary layer. And then we impose a flow split. And if you see the mesh, uh, it's highly resolved. So this is for the bulk Reynolds number of 20,000. And you can see the Z plus is, the, uh, Z plus is around 0 0.058 for the first node next to the uh, bottom wall and to the side wall, it is Y plus is of 0 0.65. So at the bottom wall, the res even for 20,000, the resolution is as good as doing a DNS. <clears throat> And uh, for the, I'm not going into the details of the Lagrangian particle model because I already discussed it during my poster session yesterday, if you had uh, come by. So quickly going to why blue waters. Uh, so if you see our uh, meshes had like around 224 to around 250 million computational points and then 120,000 particles or more. 
Now, <laughs> we also need to first at least run it to, for 90 to 150 convective time units to reach a statistically steady state. After that, we need to run it for 40 to 50 time units for the particles to go from where we initiated to the, to the two channels. So you can say that any of the simulations can take anywhere about 130 to 100 convective time units. And we have found for the biggest cases, uh, it can be really, really costly. So, if a, a resource like Blue Waters was not available, then do finishing these simulations in any kind of realistic uh, length of time was impossible. Now, scalability, if you see on Blue Waters, we were able to scale strongly up to 32,768 MPI ranks, but our efficiency starts to drop appreciably fr from M at MPI rank of 8192, which is which is basically at about n by p of 27,360, where n is, again, as I'm saying, the number of grid points, and p is the number of processor. And then, so we get around 68 to 70% efficiency here. It's around 40% efficiency here. And at 32,768, the efficiency at this, uh, at this point, the efficiency is down to almost 20%. So why aren't we, so this question vexed me. It has, uh, why aren't we scaling as good, as well as we did on Mira on Blue Waters? So I will quickly go through a simple analysis, and this is, has been inspired by, if you want to see the details of this work, inspired by the work of Fisher et al. in 2015 in the AIA conference paper. So to calculate the amount of time required, uh, uh, it's, it's the addition of the time required for computation, uh, add to addition to time required by, uh, for communication. It can be either, be, if they are non-overlapping, they can be addition, or if they are overlapping, they, they are basically max of each other. And they depend on two parameters, n, the number of computational points, and p, the number of processor. So here, and the other parameters here is t is the time to complete a parallel, parallelizable process on one processor. So if you have p processors, then it, it, that time becomes t a by p. Now, for parallel efficiency of 100%, it can be said that TA by P has to be much, much greater than TC, which is basically time to communication. But for reasonable efficiency, that is 50 to 70%, a good guess is when TA by P is equal to TC and plus C0. But here, for our analysis, we take C0 as zero. So now, the, so we have to, in a way, find a parameterization, a model for TA and a model for TC. So the way TC is modeled is usually uh, through uh, this linear model in which TC is a function of M, which is the length of 64-bit, uh, number of 64-bit word. Alpha, alpha is the internode latency and beta is the inverse bandwidth. These are the two parameters which talk about the, uh, which talk about the, how good the communication is between the processors. And TA is the inverse flop rate observed at a given algorithm on a computer in question. So this basically talks about processor speed. So we estimated TA on uh, in uh, TA for this case using a matrix matrix multiplication because that is the thing we use in NEC primarily, and for getting alpha and beta we we did ping pong test, and so the, 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 this table basically lists this table was created by Paul Fisher as a list of across across almost 30 years of different computers how how alpha beta and TA has changed over time. So this is Mira, and this is uh, from Blue Waters. And as you can see, our TA is uh, better than, so our time, uh, our processing time is smaller than that of uh, uh, Mira, much slightly less than uh, on Cray, but our alpha and beta compares also well. So then we go on to, so then we need a model for the other portion, which is the application portion. For that, if we take a Jacobi iter iteration, then it says that it should sc scale up to n by p of 3,000. But the thing is, Navier-Stokes solver is not Jacobi iteration. It is actually something more closer to a conjugate gradient iteration, which is very similar to a uh, uh, pressure poison solver. In that, apart from n by p, there is a factor which comes in, if you see on top, is number of processor. So as we go on, it says, this formula says that as we go on increasing the number of processors, this n by p will start to increase. 
and that's what happens. If we, even for Mira, N by P for around a million processors is around 12,000. Uh, uh, and, and for us also, if we see the numbers are around, uh, around 12,500 to 14,000. But why did Mira show that small number when they ran on it? Because they had something called hardware support for MPI all reduced which basically takes this factor and makes it much smaller that helps them to go to a much, much smaller N by P, which allows them to scale much, much better. So my question is, what can we, this is a question I want to ask everybody that what can we do on Blue Waters in order to, so that we can also gain something more than what we are getting now. Now going back to what my talk is about, so we had the 90 degree case at bulk turnout number of 20,000 at 50-50 splits, and what I did was, this is the instantaneous uh, velocity magnitude taken at four different slices. This is at 1% of the height, 5%, 50%, and 75%. What you can see right away is that near the bottom, uh, most of the flow is going into the side channel. But as you go away to the top, most of the flow is going to the main channel. So even if the flow is 50-50, this is what you see. And you might say this is instantaneous velocity, so in order to get a clearer picture, we did a bit of uh, over four convective time units, we did uh, averaging, and what we found was even more clearer that most of the flow near the bottom goes into the side channel, and most of the flow near the top continues in the, into the main channel. And the reason our hypothesis this is happening is that you have the flow going in the main channel, and in order to change direction, you need a pressure gradient which will be acting on it. Now, the pressure gradient has to change the inertia or change this, the inertia of the, of the flow which is in this, main, in, the, in, the, in this direction to the direction of the side channel. And it is easier to move anything, and we all know it's easier to move anything which is moving slower than to move anything which is moving faster. Because the flow speed near the bottom is slower, that's why that pressure gradient tends to shift, tends to take more of the flow from the bottom into the side channel rather than the top. And so this produces some really, because I'm, on, I'm short on time, I'm quickly show some important features. I will skip this. But we, if we take a cross section uh, here, and I plotted the velocity in the z direction, what we find is a formation of a secondary circulation on the right-hand side of the cross-section. And this becomes more clear, <clears throat> this becomes more clear when we look at uh, time averaged uh, velocity, uh, time averaged uh, velocities in the z direction. So this is in the top, and this is in the, the, these sections are taken in the side channel, and these sections are taken in the, uh, sorry, these sections are taken in the side channel, and the top sections are taken in the main channel. And in the main channel, the flow is coming out of the plane, and in the, in the bottom sections, the flow is going into the plane. So what we find is in the, in the main channel, there is formation of a counterclockwise rotating vortex, and in the side channel, we have a formation of a clockwise rotating vortex. So how does that play out? So the way that thing plays out is, so when we add sediment, now we added this Lagrangian particles, and what we have here is evolution of the position of the particles in time, x, x y coordinates. And the way I have marked it is blue, green, red, black, blue, green, red, black. So the blue is, this is the timestamp, and the last one in panel A is the first one in panel B. So as we can see, as we go over time, the, most of the particles, as the experiments showed, similar to the experiments, most of the particles or most of the sediment goes into the side channel. And very few, which is only 4.29% of the total amount of sediment goes into, continues into the main channel. This agrees very, very well with the experimental observation. What we can, what, another interesting feature what we see is that even though the, part, uh, the sediment had entered the side channel uh, quite a long time ago, but due to this secondary circulation we had seen, it basically pushes the, the, uh, all the particles 
to this recirculation zone, and then it kind of gets stuck there. And this is how exactly in, act in actual river, in real rivers, this is how they form these sandbars in, the, in, in this side of, on the left-hand side of channel. So, and then we did it across different, uh, different Reynolds number, and similarly, re similar results showed up for, for, for a laminar case. And, and, then, uh, even f and then another interesting thing we found was that when we went across different Reynolds number, the flow, even though there, was, there, there, was at a, there, was a, there comes a time at Reynolds number of 500, that even though the flow is, that comes in is, is laminar, after bifurcation, the flow is unsteady or turbulent. <clears throat> so the conclusions and next steps are uh, flow and sediment transport was successfully modeled at an idealized 90 degree diversion for bulk number 20,000, and we are able to capture the phenomena of Boulier effect. The driving mechanism of this highly nonlinear phenomena has been identified. This is most of the flow, that is most of the flow near the bottom of the channel enters the lateral channel, taking along with the nearbed sediment. The flow, pattern of, uh, the flow patterns are very similar for, for the whole range of Reynolds number. Currently, simulations are being done to complete the sediment transport, so we have completed all the flow simulations for all the different cases. Now we are just completing the sediment transport, so we will have that in the next two to three months. And NEC was found to scale to 30, to strongly to 32,768 MPI ranks on blue waters, though the efficiency reduces to 68.5% after MPI rank of 8192. And as I said, even though NEC 5000's parallel scalability performance on blue waters is relatively good, it seems compared to Mira, the issue is, is the lack of hardware support and MPI all reduced. So, and thank you, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Rob, so we are working with Dr. Rob Sineros to get an animation for one of those cases. We are in continuous communications with him. We would like to thank Tom Cortez, with whom, Dr. Tom Cortez, with whom we are working to get. So now we are using the PGI compiler to run NEC. So we want to shift to Cray so that we can use the inbuilt, Cray's inbuilt optimization tools to optimize NEC much, much better on Blue Waters. And we also thank Dr. Greg Bauer for responding regularly on questions regarding writing the proposals. Thank you.